All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll help me welcome Eric Erickson, please. Thank you. And uh, welcome to the Fayette County Republican Party. Thanks for having me. And um, I don't know if you've ever been down this way before. I, I have. I've yeah. actually been here, gosh, uh, for Marty Hartman did an event for him a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they had a great smear campaign against Marty in oh, his yes. last uh, election. And he was victorious along with yes. David Stover. And I think we only lost one in that entire campaign. I, I where think they, we did. Where they mm -hmm. tried to gang up. And I think large... Uh, in part to you and your ability to get the word out. So I, I discovered two years ago that the Noonan area is actually the number two listenership for my show. Uh, the Woodstock area is number one, Noonan is number two. So awesome. I, I'm, I'm happy to use the microphone on occasion. Well, you are one of the more intriguing characters on radio and Twitter and several <laughs> other things. Um, it's hard for people to pigeonhole you. I've probably seen four or five. I did a little research on Google mm -hmm. and kind of looked at some things. And there's all kinds of descriptions of Eric Harrison. But what I was wondering is, how would you describe yourself? Uh, Middle-aged fat guy from Macon. <laughs> um, I got a wife and two kids, so I spend my time talking on radio because I don't get a word in edgewise at home. <laughs> um, I, th that would be, look, I've just, I live in Macon. I, I don't live in Atlanta. We made a choice to stay down there where people knew who I would be, knew who I was before I started doing TV or radio. So I'm just, I mean, I like to cook on the weekend and hang out with my kids and go to soccer. I'm, I'm, what I'm finding is that of people who are in the media and on radio and TV, there are a lot of people who they're almost a caricature of themselves or right. there's something else on TV. I, I'm just me. I'm, I have a very messy office and a messy life and you can see all my failures in cooking and on Instagram and just, <laughs> I'm myself. Well, talking about Instagram, you are just about in more forms of media with Twitter, the radio, uh, awful. all over the place. Tell us what, what all are all the things that you're involved in. How much time do you spend a week on all of the broadcast materials and the, the I, well, social a lot media? Is, so, you know, I've got two shows now, as, as I mentioned. So I do 9 to noon. We're on 10 stations. We'll, we should be on 12 stations by the end of the month. We're basically doing a show and we're giving it away for free to any station. It's a Georgia show. Right. So we're only giving it to Georgia stations, but any Georgia station can take it. Uh, other than in Atlanta, where I'm on WSB 4 to 6. And so I get up at 6 in the morning and do show prep until 8.30. I get into the studio. I'm blessed to work from home. I get out. I've got from noon to 1 to grab lunch, uh, try to go to the gym from 1 to 2, and then from 2 to 4, make sure nothing else has changed right. in the headlines. Go get my kids from school at 3 so I can have some time with them. Home by 3.30 in the studio at 3.45, out by 6.00 eat, put the kids in bed by nine, I'm up till midnight making, seeing what over the over overnight stuff is, uh, then get back up at six and do it all over again. Wow. Other than that, you have nothing else to Other do. Other than that, and, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm in seminary too. I, I take one day a week where, where I do seminary. I, I've had to put that on hold to launch this new show, but about to start back up with it too. So. And seminary is, are you doing that through the internet or are you I, actually no, doing I, it I'm outside? actually, so I, I was doing it, uh, so I was at Reformed Theological in Marietta, uh, moved to Southeastern Baptist to work on my doctorate, but I'm really bad at independent study, so I've moved back into uh, RTS to finish my MDiv uh, before I do the doctorate, and so I can go to class once a week and take classes. You know, a question I've always wanted to ask you, too, because you do mention your faith a lot, and you do mention the fact that you're in seminary and, and doing all those classes. Um, where does your politics and your faith intersect? I mean, where is, what, what's the nexus for your faith and politics? I have to be careful how I say this because a lot of friends of mine get mad at me and say, are you saying I'm not a Christian? No, I, I'm just saying I have found over the years that I've had to pull my politics more towards how I view my faith. And I think a lot of times people get so wrapped up in politics, they try to conform their faith to their politics so they don't have to change uh, because they've been so dogmatic in politics. And, and I think that one of the biggest and most eye-opening revelations to me, in fact, when I give a lot of speeches these days, I spend a lot of time talking to nonprofit groups, and I almost always give them a spiel that I gave on radio the other night on, on Jeremiah 29.7, seek the welfare of the city you're, where you're in exile, because there you'll find your welfare. That we as a people have gotten so used to developing our own community online with people who look just like us and think like us on social media, and we have no idea who the person is next door to us. And when we're sick, it's going to be the person next door who brings the food, not the person on Facebook who's telling me what I want to hear who's halfway around the world. So. 
I think that whether you're in politics or you're in religion, you change the world by focusing on your hometown, not by focusing on Washington as much or by focusing on social media. Unfortunately, I, I would love to delete my Twitter account. I, I hate Twitter, <laughs> but I feel compelled to do it. And frankly, when there are stations who are picking me up, they want to know how many Twitter followers do you have. Right. Um, right. You know, there's that great story in, in the Bible of Jesus casting the demons out of the two possessed men, and they say they're legion, and he puts them in the herd of pigs. And they run down into the sea and they drown. And what the Bible leaves out is that after the pigs have drowned, the demons all got Twitter accounts. And that explains social media. <laughs> all right, so this begs the question now. Um, I looked at your Twitter page. I'm, I'm, I'm a follower, and I just went back and looked at it again. And you've got Romans 116 on the header. Do you oftentimes find yourself having to hold back on a particular Twitter comment because you've got Romans 116 uh, yeah, on yeah, your yeah, head? You know, I often get lectured by other people say, you, you call yourself a Christian, because uh, I'm laughing. It's amazing how people, particularly people who aren't Christians, think you can't have a sense of humor if you are a Christian. Like for, or for example, uh, calling out the, the, the Swedish kid who had access to the prince's yacht to come to the United States to yell at us. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, we, we should not set social policy based on a 16 year old with a de developmental disability who's from Sweden. You know, oh, you call yourself a Christian, you're insulting a child. Well, listen, I, I blessed are the children who are gonna get into heaven, but don't set global policy based on what they say. And God probably appreciates common sense. I, I think you, God you does appreciate that. common sense. <laughs> um, you and your wife have had some real major <laughs> health scares. And, and you've talked about it on the radio. Right. This is nothing that, you know, I'm, I'm not talking out of, out of the circle here. What has those challenges and those near-death experiences meant to your life and your family life and your, and your broadcasting? Definitely setting priorities. In fact, I wrote a book for my kids. It was a letter to my kids, and my wife said I should put it online. I put it online. Uh, David Brooks at the New York Times read it, wrote a column about it, and then a publisher said, would you turn it into a book? So I wrote a book about all of this in 2017. Just the very short end of the story is in March of 2016, as all nightmares begin, I went to CrossFit and started having serious health problems and just assumed I was going to the gym and I'm allergic to exercise. And <laughs> it, it just got worse and I assumed it was allergies. So I wound up being put in the hospital in ICU for a week and a half, uh, nearly died, had 20 some odd blood clots in my lungs. Three is typically fatal. Uh, the day that I went into the, literally as I'm in the waiting room waiting for them to put me in ICU, the Mayo Clinic called my wife, they had examined her a decade ago and said, we think you have a very rare form of lung cancer, you need to come get, a, uh, get an exam. And so on the day that I get into the hospital, nearly dying, I mean, it literally is so bad, I'm in the cardiac ICU unit and the doctor sees the scans on the boards and asks if they've taken that patient, if they've taken that body to the morgue yet. That's how wow. bad it was. That's, um, pretty, that's pretty close. Yeah. So while I'm in the hospital, my wife's dad has to fly her to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona where they do a lung biopsy on her and find out she does have this very rare form of lung cancer. Uh, there's no cure for it, uh, but she takes a small pill that keeps the tumors from growing, uh, so we're good. But uh, that all happened in a week, right. in March of 2016, and, and I, I decided, you know, there are really important things in life, and if I had to list all of them in the top 10, the presidential election in 2016 wasn't actually that important, right. and it, it reprioritized my life. I, I, I need to spend more time with my kids, I need to spend more time with my wife, I need to spend more time reminding people that Washington doesn't affect your life as much. And I used to get conservatives very angry with me before 2017 when I pointed out that yes, things have certainly changed, but on a day-to-day -day basis, the Obama administration hasn't upended your life. And now I tell progressives the exact same thing. Donald Trump has given you a little more take-home pay, but other than that, he hasn't changed your life. And they're enraged now as much as conservatives were, but it's true. Seek the welfare of the city in which you live. Your school board and your local public sanitation department pay, play, play a bigger role in your daily life than anyone in Washington, D.C. All right. I, I read an account where someone had called your uh, call-in person and said that they were heading to Macon to murder your family while you were on the air, and Homeland Security actually had to yeah. get involved. Tell us about that. Gosh, that was... You know, I can't even remember what year that was. This has happened. You know, in, in 2016, I, I, I now famously, I guess, didn't support the president, which is ironic because now he calls all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we had, we had people show up and threaten us at our house and had to have armed guards for several months. This was, gosh, I want to say this was the year before that. And 
the call screener, it was, a, it was the, actually the, the head of call screening at our studio was filling in that night, and this guy calls, uh, Islamic guy, and clearly from his accent, she was able to trace his number and find out who he was, could describe my house mm. and where I lived, gave that address. First he says, I, now that I'm talking about it, I remember it more. First he said, I'm, I'm on my way down there to kill him. And the call screener very flippantly said, well, good luck, he's not here tonight. He says, I know, I'm looking at his house right now, that's Ooh. where he is, and gave my home address. At which point she captured, we have a, a security program, she captured all this. And, I mean, they got the police that night, got the Homeland Security, and got it taken care of. And was he arrested, I'm hoping? I believe that it was an unfavorable resolution for him. Good, good, yes. and it should be. Yes. Um, 2015. Atlant the Atlantic <laughs> yes. calls you the most power powerful conservative in America. Yeah, uh, yeah. What does that do to you when somebody calls you the most powerful conservative uh, well, you in know, America? It was kind of garbage to begin with. I, I, I knew the reporter. I, I never thought I was. I was very flattered to have a profile done. Um, but it, it, it certainly did put me on the radar for a lot of people I wasn't on the radar for and also made me more mindful there are a whole lot of people who now listen to me who probably didn't in the past. Right. Um, so maybe I shouldn't be as flippant. I have a real hard time not being flippant with certain people on social media, still do. Um, but I definitely have a lot of people who listen to what I think, people who disagree with me virulently, but they still listen. Is that something where, you know, when you get that title, that's pretty, that's, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. Is well, that something where you, you know, kind of have to keep things in check and you have to remind you yourself do. to keep things yeah, in check? Well, and you know, it was hard for my kids because they did a big photo shoot. They wanted to do a photo shoot of my family, and my wife and I were very apprehensive of having our children in a national magazine. Uh, so there are a couple of pictures of my kids, but you can't tell because they're running so fast through the pictures. They're just blurs of kids <laughs> around my wife and me, which was all stage. It, and it was, it was definitely something. You know, the, the uh, Atlanta Magazine put me on the cover last year as the, one of the most powerful people in Atlanta. And it's very, very weird to be at the public checkout with you staring back at yourself. It, especially uh, if you have more than 16 line. items, that yeah, is really a problem. So. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I got to listen. I'm confused. I'm from Louisiana, and my dad is Swedish. Which country do I go back to? <laughs> well, the, the Atlantic built you up. The Daily B sends oh, yeah. you down. Yes. L let's talk about what senior editor Andrew Creel said. Uh, he, he had an article about you, and he says, Why does anyone take Eric Erickson seriously? And I'll, I'll give you a quote. He said, Given how often the right-wing pundit preaches civility, and then does exactly the opposite. Why does mainstream media pretend he offers substantive value? Now, you know, so that guy has been writing critical of me since 2007. Yeah, I, 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 I pulled mean, every one is, of them yeah, up. He's it, been it, there. So <laughs> let me give you the context of why this guy says I, I preach civility and I don't really mean it. That particular article was based on a tweet I had where I said, I don't really believe that these movements of migrants from Central America right before the 2018 election are not in some way coordinated to put pressure on the election. And I, I do believe there actually were some entities that were later exposed as actually participating in that. And he was outraged that I would say anything like that. And so then he got really upset when I was on Meet the Press. And the week after I wrote that I was on Meet the Press and said Republicans really need to get out of buying conspiracy theories, he's like, oh my gosh, this guy's a conspiracy theorist. And I'm like, no, actually, I'm, I got a valid point here. But you know, some people you'll never convince, uh, but you don't throw your pearl before swine. And, and he did give you a smidgen of credit where he actually confessed that, you know, if you say something that you think is a little off and, and, and you come back, you admit it. Oh, yeah. And, and he I, said I that. To. Yes. Yeah, uh, which is probably the nicest thing the guy's ever said about <laughs> You know, I, I live rent-free in certain people's heads. He's one of them and, and have for years. And I, I don't know what I ever did. Maybe I, like, took the cab that he was waiting for or something. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so how does the, the left-leaning pundits and, and people out there in the media world, how do they still come at you after you've been on CNN as, as, as a you know, commentator or, or an NBC? Or well, it, how does that work? You know, so I was with Fox for five years, and in the last couple of years, I really didn't do a lot of Fox time. One, they had a real bias for in-studio guests. And two, I, I was critical of the president. And so they typically, if you were a conservative who said anything critical of the president, they didn't put you on Fox. And, and I understood that, but I wasn't going to tell people something I didn't believe. So we, I just didn't go on TV. I got paid to not work, essentially. Uh, I got off Fox. Uh, I wanted out of my contract. They didn't really want to have me back last February. And from February of last year until the end of last year, 
I literally did more TV hits than I did in five years at Fox. Wow. And then I said I would vote for the president in 2020, and I haven't been on since. They've cut you completely <laughs> off. Pretty much. I, I, I think February was the last time. Um, so, I mean, if, if you wanted to know, is there a bias against people who support the president on TV? Yes. I, I mean, I, I do think I'm an example at this point of someone who I will be very critical of the president to the point that the White House will call and complain. But I also say I'm, I'm going to vote for the guy in 2020. Look at these idiots on the other side. Of course I'm going to vote for him. Uh, we may disagree on things, but there's a lot of stuff that I do agree with him on. But sure. we can't have that on TV. You've either got to be a Republican who is adamantly opposed to him, or you've got to be a Democrat these days. And here's a, will you, would you stick with this um, action, or will you take it back comment here? The Megyn Kelly uh, issue. Oh, I, I absolutely would have stuck with it. I, I think it was the right thing to do. Um, J just it, to let people know, yeah. uh, Donald Trump had made a statement about blood, blood was coming out of her eyes. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, she was bleeding out of her eyes uh, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, you, and you said that uh, you rescinded an invitation. Yeah, I wasn't going to have him at the Red State Gathering in 2015. Right. And, you know, he, 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 obviously this got a bigger story than it would have been. I called them and asked them, did the president really mean the way this is being interpreted by a lot of people? And they're like, no. I said, will, the, will uh, Mr. Trump at the time, will he clarify the statement? Because there are a lot of people who are interpreting this way. Right. Like, absolutely not. I thought, I've got literally every single Republican presidential candidate, and the, all two billion of them were flying to Atlanta to be on stage at this event. And I said, I'm sorry, this is going to be a distraction to them. It's a disservice to them. So I, I, I don't want to have him here because that's all everybody's going to ask him about if he's coming. Well, that's all anybody wanted to talk about anyway. Sure. So it turned into a big story. It was kind of funny, about two months after that, I wrote something uh, praising a position he had. And, you know, so the president doesn't use email. What the president does is he reads an article, someone gives it to him, and he takes a Sharpie marker, and he writes in big Sharpie print something, and then he has the secretary scan it as a PDF, and his secretary emails it to you. Uh, so I get, I get this email from this unknown address at trumporg.com or whatever, and it's from, so glad to have you on my side again. Well, then we, we did 2016. And, you know, this past January, I actually, I was, I was putting our Christmas tree up. Um, so I'm, at some point in my life, I became allergic to pine. I don't know why. Um, I was never allergic to pine as a kid, but now if I even t look at it, I'll, I'll get a rash. So we have a fake tree, and I've got a storage unit. It's, I wanted like a really big tree bigger than I should have gotten, and I can't put it in our attic, so I have a storage unit just for our Christmas tree. And I'm pushing it in, and the phone rings. And it's an unlisted number. And I'm like, okay, this is CNN. CNN wants me to come on. And they call back. I don't answer it. It's unlisted. So I keep pushing it in, and they call back. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to be on. So I keep pushing this tree in, and I've almost got it all the way in. It's on wheels. I've got it leaned up. And it's a third time. I'm like, well, I guess this is important. So my hands are inside the Christmas tree. And I reach down to my Apple Watch and touch it with my nose and answer the call. And there's this voice on the other end that says, is this Eric Erickson? I said, yes. So please hold for the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I jump back. The tree fell over. <laughs> and it's like... Eric, this is the president. I mean, this was the president of the United States. Says, I, Mike's with me, and I, the vice president I've been friends for a long time. He says, hello, Eric. And I'm like, yeah, this is really them. And we talk for a few minutes. Now, fast forward several months. My, my son has been at soccer practice. It's the last week of school, so we did soccer practice. We then had to go to an event for my child, for my daughter. So then we're like, let's go to, um, there's a little pizza place in town. So when it's like 9 o'clock at night, the phone rings. It's an unlisted number. Like, this has got to be somebody important. So we're sitting there having pizza. It's 9 o'clock at night. I answer the phone. Usually it's a lady who says, is this Eric Erickson? Yes, please hold for the president. I just answer the phone and say, hello. It's your favorite president. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, he's got to be the most, I can't think of, at, le at least in our lifetime, a president that has had that kind of personality. Well, and I you mean, know, so I, 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 Ronald Reagan may have had a touch of it. Don't maybe. interpret this the wrong way, please. But, you know, during, during 2015, 2016, you always had these Clinton staffers saying, you know, Hillary Clinton's a very lovely person behind the scenes. Now, you kind of got the sense that, well, they may be disappeared if they didn't say that with Clinton. <laughs> but they, they always, they, they always, uh, I'm actually, never, I better not say what I was about to say. There's a camera here. But they always said, I kind of feel that way with the president. He, he's a deeply funny person. Yeah. Um, all these people who say he, go, he goes around the White House storming around in, in these terrible moods, I have a lot of really good friends who work for him. They're like, 
<laughs> he's a riot. He, he's a really funny person. His natural ability to ab lib at these rallies right. and, and just to his motions, and there's nothing staged about it. It just seems well, to flow. You know, I, it just, I sent a text to a friend of mine who works for him the other day, and I said, you know, why don't y'all just let him freeform his speeches at the United Nations? I mean, give him kind of an outline and then just let him go to it. Because that teleprompter speech, I nearly fell asleep. Yeah, it was, it. it was a sleepy but time. But could you imagine Donald Trump at the United Nations Unplugged? That would be awesome. The <laughs> whole <laughs> world. World War III yeah, probably you know, starts or yeah, something like that. I just, you know, I mean, you give him a list of things. Hit China, hit Venezuela, hit Iran. Say we're working on North Korea, go. And I've got to, you've got to talk about this one. He's there, he sees the Egyptian prime minister, and he says, there's my favorite, <laughs> my favorite dictator. dictator. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, the media and he says this on camera, yeah. might. The media was appalled by this. By the way, so the president of Egypt is a wonderful human being. Uh, and, and he's really hit it off with the president. And I was like, you know, I would do that. I don't know if the president should do that. I would totally do something like that. But yeah, yeah. Some things presidents you expect presidents not to do. Let, let's look at some retrospective stuff. You, in 2010, you wrote a book, A Red State Uprising, mm -hmm. and you were disenchanted with the Obama administration. Can't figure out why you would be. Yeah. Um, but uh, you were also talking about some fundamental changes that were needed in government to make things work. Three years into Trump, um, what's your evaluation based on what you were saying in 2010? I mean, have oh, you I, seen I, some of that change? I, or? I think it's terrible, and, and you can't blame the president. You, you've got a Congress where the Republicans controlled it for a number of years, where they said they cared about the size and scope of the federal government. If only we had the White House back, we could do something. We got a trillion dollar deficit this yeah. year. Um, you know, for years I supported Republican candidates who said they were concerned about the size and scope of government. and. They still say that, but they clearly aren't. And that's, that's a real disappointment. Uh, our, we are going to bankrupt the country for our kids. And, you know, I just, I realize I talk to friends of mine who are macro economists, somethings or other, and, and they can give me all sorts of terms for what's going on and stuff. And, and my general rule in my personal finance is, if I don't understand it, I'm not going to do it. And I kind of think at this point, if the country doesn't understand something, the country shouldn't do it. And yet you got a lot of these bureaucratic economists telling the president, we're going to do this, this, and this, and we can somehow twist the gears to get a particular outcome. And no bureaucratic government's ever been able to do that. Sure, sure. With Now that the president is your best friend, and you talk on the phone uh, yeah. often with him. We can go that far. <laughs> well, I just... Do you consider yourself, because I think, would you put yourself in the never, never Trump camp in 16? Yeah, yeah. I Would mean, I was the guy who camp? came up with the term. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so, so now, would you say you're a Trump supporter, or you just can't stand the other side? Oh, look, I am a supporter, and I can't stand the other side. Okay. Um, I, okay. I, I, I've written several times now that, on the whole, it makes people really mad when I say this on the left, but you're not really getting an out of the ordinary Republican presidency from Donald Trump. Right. Right. You're getting tax cuts. You're getting deregulation. You're getting a more aggressive foreign policy that puts American interests ahead of global communitarian interests. Uh, you're getting conservative judges. You're, I, I don't like tariffs. I think tariffs actually are really bad, and we're, it's, he's going to hurt the economy and probably ruin his re-election chances if he doesn't fix that. Um, I certainly wish he had a different tone. I would love to tell my kids, here's a great role model for you. But by and large, he's not much different policy-wise than a George W. Bush or a Ronald Reagan or... Uh, and Richard Nixon or any of these other Republicans. Um, and, and the Democrats hate that because they just have a virulent hatred for him in the way Republicans hated Bill Clinton back in the 90s. Uh, everything he does is bad, even when it's actually pretty good. At the same time, I look at the other side, it's like, what the hell happened to these people? Right. Um, just a few years ago, they were thinking, you know, we'll split the baby on, on health care, and now suddenly, I mean, I've got my new Apple Watch straight from Cupertino, and it comes with a compass that points towards Moscow because it came from California. <laughs> um, and I just, I mean, what happened? I mean, actually, when I'm in Georgia, it points towards Stacey Abrams. When I leave the state, apparently it points towards Moscow. Um, I mean, what happened to these people? They, they've gone completely off the left. Suddenly, we're going to let moms give birth to their children, make them comfortable, and then decide whether or not to kill them. I know. I mean, what on earth happened? They're, they're, they're nuts. Yeah. What do you think about Trump in terms of his attempts, at least, of trying to keep his campaign promises, the major ones. He has. Um, listen, I, I really disagree with him on tariffs, but he's keeping a campaign promise. Um, he, I, I loved watching, you know, Bush says, I'm going to move the, uh, 
the uh, embassy to J Jerusalem. Yep. Obama says it, and Trump right. goes, move "Let's the, do it. Move <laughs> the embassy to Jerusalem," and they do it. And, and everyone like, else is like, "Oh my gosh, we can't do that. <laughs> we just say that stuff." Um, you know, Donald Trump is. I, I, I sometimes say he is what happens when you elect the comment section of the internet to the presidency. <laughs> um, but then, oftentimes, I mean, this is a guy who, if he says he's going to do something, he tries to do it at least, and. One of the things I hate about politics today, and the reason so many people on both sides of the aisle are so cynical, is because they know that when a lot of politicians make promises, they don't really mean them. With him, he really does mean the stuff he says. All right. And he brought a Sharpie marker, signed the wall out yeah. there. And, and then uh, expanded a hurricane track. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the wall is actually being built, and I think much... Right. I, I have to give him credit for the way he's been able to pull that off because the right. Congress hasn't helped him one bit. Yeah, and and, and so. I, I love the idea of reappropriating projects from Democratic districts and sending that money to build the wall. I, I mean, the Democrats <laughs> would do that. <laughs> sure, sure they would. Um, the constant push for impeachment. For three years now, right. it's been impeachment, impeachment, impeachment. Are the Democrats just trashing themselves for 2020, uh, not only for the presidential race, but for some of these races where, in Congress, where Trump won the district, but the Democrats riding the right. space in Congress? Uh, you know, I have really mixed feelings about this in that I don't support impeachment for the president, but the whistleblower complaint paints a path for them to pursue by making sure they know there are multiple White House officials who probably, some of them will be political appointees, some of them won't. Uh, and find a, a request for production of documents they can get to prove their case against the president so they can drag this out. And the question is, what happens when they drag it out? And I don't know. The thing that, if I were in the White House, what would keep me up at night is knowing there actually are a lot of Republicans in Congress who hate the president, yeah. and many of them have decided not to run again. So they're not going to be held accountable to the voters. So right. what happens when the Democrats actually get something that suggests there was improper? I mean, listen, I read the transcript. I actually read it on radio, and, and it, somebody was actually blowing me up for it, saying, oh, look, you can see you went into damage control mode. I was like, no, I, I saw all these people online say, this is really, really, really bad. And then I started reading it, I was like, why is this bad? This is something he would say in public. Right. Uh, this is Trump being Trump. Uh, and then to have the media come out and say, the president asked them to do a favor, let's skip these next 276 words and go to, investigate Joe Biden as opposed to investigate crowds, flare, or whatever it was. Um, I think the media is the president's best friend when it comes to this stuff. Um, I, I don't know in 2020 if the president will win or if the media and Democrats will lose. All right. I was shocked. I mean, New York, New York Times, Washington Post, I expect them to always lean heavy, report on the story before there is a story and that type of thing. They've been pretty much universal in that. I was surprised to see the Wall Street Journal Myth this Ukrainian thing so bad. The eight times he said this eight times right. comment and all these things. Did that shock you at all that the Wall Street Journal? No, I, I think the, the Wall Street Journal editorial page is fairly conservative, but the, you got to remember that one of the Wall Street Journal's biggest um, Washington reporters was until recently a guy named Neil King who left the Washington beat to go work for Fusion GPS. Right. right. Um, I, I think the Washington press corps itself is largely polluted, uh, it is in a bubble. I have a lot of friends from my days at CNN who I think work very hard to recognize they have a bias and need to fix it. I don't think that always translates on the air. And I think that CNN these days is caught in a situation where, hey, MSNBC is beating us. We don't want to be more like Fox, so let's be more like MSNBC. And it shows on air. Right. I mean, the, the on-air product at CNN, I think, is declined. There are some great reporters there. They're great reporters at Fox. They never get credit because they work at Fox. Um, but the media, gosh, I mean, just it, pull all of the political stories out. Look at Carson King in Missouri, who raised a million dollars for charity after holding up a sign on Sports Center saying, I want beer money, donates it to a charity, Anheuser-Busch says they'll give money too, and then a reporter who had a history of using the N-word on social media does a story about how in 2011, when he was 16 years old, he said something bad on Twitter, right. something that was racist, in fact, on, on Twitter in 2011. Um, and so they're going to destroy the kid and hurt this charity to get the kid for something from 2011. The media is its own worst enemy these days. The, the sins of our childhood era right. that we're in now, what would your advice be to parents and even to high school, middle school students <coughs> with social media? I actually have a book on this. This is part of my book that I wrote to my kids. Um, if we can't allow ourselves to move beyond the worst thing we've done on the internet, then we have no incentive to grow as a people. 
if if I'm going to get punished for being a terrible person as a 16 year old, I might as well stay a terrible person as a 16 year old. Uh, might not. Why grow up? I'm going to be punished for what I did before. Uh, we don't let our kids have access to social media. Uh, they can have access to social media at some point, but they're 14 and 10 right now. There's no reason for them to have it. Uh, they need to understand when they head in that direction that the internet's forever. And frankly, even when they get to the point of wanting it, there's really no reason to have a Twitter account. There's really no reason to have Snapchat. My kids were at a Christian private, they're at a different school now, a Christian school. They were at a Christian private school where there's a big scandal right now because some of the kids are trading naked pictures of each other oh. on social media, on Snapchat, because it supposedly goes away, but it doesn't. Um, and you got a lot of parents who are oblivious to all this stuff. And told my kids, no, you, you can't have a cell phone and you don't need access to the internet. I did, uh, you know, my wife and I were convinced we would not give our, then third, she just turned 14 last week. We were not going to give her a cell phone until she was 16, she could drive, might as well not. But I had to do an overnight field trip to Atlanta last May. It was her and three other girls in my car. I'm not kidding when I tell you they didn't talk to each other the entire way there. There yeah. was not a sound made. They texted back and forth. And my kid couldn't participate in the conversation until I connected her phone to my phone's hotspot so that she could connect in because they were with all these other kids in other cars. They I mean, occasionally you'd hear a laughter, but that was it. I was like, my child actually can't be in her peer group without access to a mobile device where she can text. It was like, I guess I need to get her this. Um, it's, it's horrific to me, and it's horrific to my parents. But then, of course, you know, my parents went through a similar thing with me when I wanted a computer to have email, to email my friends when I was in, in junior high. The world has changed. Um, our kids, I suspect our kids, grandkids, will have, like, super fat thumbs right. um, as the evolutionary process works on their, on their keyboards. Um, or they may come with, like, we may start recreating chips in our brains. or I, I don't know. Um, evolution, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see whether God has a sense of humor or whether Darwin is right one way or the other. I think if Darwin is right, we may not be around for another couple of generations. Um, but your kids don't need the internet. I mean, they may for a research project, but they don't need Snapchat. If you come to my house, by the way, I don't, I don't care how old you are, if you come to my house, uh, Snapchat won't work at our house, TikTok won't. For those of you who don't know, you don't want to know TikTok. Uh, <laughs> and Twitter will not work at our house. Um, I have an exemption for my phone, but otherwise, no. If you're coming to my house, I don't want you staring at the phone. I want to have a conversation with you. Right. You know, a lot of people are saying that perhaps we've lost a generation, the millennial, Gen Xers, uh, because of this uh, media frenzy, losing social skills, feeling sheltered, these safe spaces mm -hmm. on college campuses. Um, a lot of them are saying socialism is the way to go. A lot of them, uh, you know, don't want to... Uh, uh, they don't really care about the First Amendment. Right. We don't really need it. What, what's your take on that? Are they going to come back? Do you think you we know, can get them back? You, when, they, when they earn a paycheck and look at the tax withholding, they might. Uh, but this actually is, and I don't want to make light of this, this is actually a, a real statistic that the millennials are the first generation who can expect to go into the workforce earning less than their parents, yeah. uh, which is actually pretty staggering, um, that they will, their lifetime earnings are expected to be less than their parents the economy did fail them. The problem is that it wasn't the George Bush economy that failed them, it was the Barack Obama economy that failed them. Uh, and, and opening their eyes to that fact is something that has to be done. Um, but I, listen, events change things. I'm a, a firm believer. For example, I, I actually did this research project when I was in college. The very first occurrence of the theme that Republicans would never win the White House again because of demography came after Richard Nixon's election in 1968. Um, and every year since, every presidential election, there's been Republicans are going to start losing because of demographics. And as the country becomes less white, the drumbeat goes even harder that uh, Republicans are about to lose. But you know what? Hispanic voters in Florida sided with the Republicans. They got Rick Scott and Ron DeSantis elected. Mm -hmm. In Georgia, uh, Brian Kemp got 39.8% of the Hispanic vote. Uh, the president right now, according to public opinion polling, is outperforming Mitt Romney with Hispanic voters. Uh, demography isn't destiny unless you let it be. Events change things. You think the economy overrides demography? By oh, I absolutely think the economy overrides demography, but that's one worry I have with tariffs, um, is that I think if they ride out long term and China wants to mess with the president, you know, Russia supposedly stole the election, but when China escalates the trade war, it'll just be business as usual, right. um, not actually defeating the president. I, I think 
Peter Navarro whispering in the president's ear has been a bad thing for the president. Well, you know, we've heard the Democrats on the border wall and the southern border concentration camps and mm -hmm. Nazi Funny how they dropped that all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would actually think if, if they really believed there were concentration camps on the border, they would be picking up torches and pitchforks and marching. And instead, they've moved on to this Swedish kid with a yacht. Well, you know, when you, when you bring up concentration camps and ethnic cleansing, uh, I think the Nazi uh, was so overplayed, the Nazi references right. were so overplayed by the Democrats that they've actually kind of lost ground. Do you Oh, I, I think that? so. Listen, um, I realize CNN <clears throat> never actually ran a report on it, but it did make the New York Times and the LA Times that a, a man tried to firebomb an ICE facility because he thought it was a concentration camp. Right. Um, yeah, you know, if words mean things, uh, words mean things on both sides. How important do you think the border wall is on the southern border? I mean, is this something that meaningful, or is it just a campaign promise that people have attached a dream you know, to? I, I honestly don't think that it's as huge a deal as a lot of Republicans make it. I, I do think there are some systemic problems in Central America that we could work with those countries on to stem the tide. At the same time, I don't care. I do think that if you built a physical border between Mexico and the United States, that suddenly the domestic immigration conversation changes. And a lot of Republicans who are in the position of round every single person up and send them home might say, okay, if no more people can come, maybe we're okay leaving the grandmother who's been here for four years here, just don't give her citizenship. And it changes the conversation. Interestingly enough, Hispanic voters, they're okay with the wall. If Hispanic voters who are legal immigrants to this country are okay with a border wall, why do a bunch of rich white people from Harvard have a problem with it? You, you, yeah, absolutely. Do, do you, and especially when they're saying they're American Indians and everything yeah, else, yeah, too, yeah, you know, yeah, and they yeah. lie about the thing. Yeah. But, but, I mean, it makes it even, rubs it in even more. What do you think about the Dreamers? What's going to happen with the Dreamers? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, this is one of those, those faith politics issues for me. Uh, I think if you were brought here by your parents as a two- or three-year-old <laughs> and you have no real memory of your home country, I'm okay with you staying. Uh, I think if you came over as an 18-year-old, go home, get in line behind the other people trying to get here. I think if you've been here for 40 years, you're a senior citizen now, and you, you, there's really no reason to send you home if you're not getting benefits or if you're paying taxes getting benefits. I actually know a couple in Atlanta that has a housekeeper who is an illegal alien. The only crime she has ever broken was crossing the border. She doesn't even drive because she doesn't want to break a law. She just wanted to come work here. She sends 90% of every dollar she earns back to Mexico to take care of her family. I'm okay having people here like that. I think we forget as a country that until the late 1960s, we had a migrant worker program where we allowed this, where people could either come seasonally or like that. And it was American unions that said they're taking jobs away from Americans. Uh, we need to stop this. Well, guess what? No Americans wanted to go down and, and pick oranges in Florida. Right. So farmers started relying on illegal aliens who now have no incentive to go back home and fight. If you want to come in for migrant work, give them the paperwork, let them pay the taxes on the income, and then go back home. Most of them don't want to stay here anyway. And we actually I mean, would you want to stay here with Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren as a president anyway? No. <laughs> you would want to stay in the country too. So. And, and we had migrant programs in the 50s and 60s, We did, right? and unions and so, killed uh, them. Yeah, so they just disappeared, and it was right. really sad. I, listen, I am virulently opposed to someone whose grandfather was Swedish and literally stowed away on a cabin liner and came to this country as a 10-year-old. Um, I am really opposed to illegal immigration. I do think that the conversation changes among Republicans who are opposed to illegal immigration. If we can secure the border and say no more people are going to come, what do we do with the people here? We would be more willing to accept there are classes of people, some maybe stay, others go home. Let's find them and send them home. Mm -hmm. But I have a real problem with Democrats saying there's no problem at all. Right. Uh, remember in January and February it was this is a manufactured crisis. Now suddenly even the New York Times is saying, hey, this is a real crisis, the president should have the money to do it. And the Democrats are like, no, it's a real crisis. But the real crisis is their concentration camps. Hey, let's talk about global warming. Right. And then when they, the Democrats forced that cap on the beds, number of beds right. you could have, that really stymied the government's ability to, to house oh, it. Oh, it absolutely people. did. And then, hey, let's go attack the private sector companies willing to donate stuff to make people's lives comfortable. Yeah, this, I, could, I couldn't believe that when, they, uh, when the union or whatever Never it was. Never let a crisis they, go to yeah, waste. The employees stormed the, the factory and wouldn't right. build the beds. I mean, incredible. Um, as a Twitter user, and, and you, you put it out there, you're, you're outspoken on Twitter. i tell you what I think. So i got to think, what do you think about the president's use of Twitter? <sighs> there, there are plenty of days where I think he does more harm than good. There are some days where I think it's, it's really worthwhile what he does. 
that dear diary tweet to Jim Acosta a few years ago was priceless. <laughs> um, but you know, th there are times where I think that the president distracts from his own message. For example, last year, I can give you a very specific example you will all remember. Last year, the president gave a really, really good State of the Union address. And he had the families who had children or, or relatives who had been killed by the MS-13 gang. And every single person in the country was talking about that speech. And the media could not avoid talking about that speech. That was on a Tuesday night. And on a Thursday, he tweeted. And suddenly, everybody talked about the tweet instead of talking about that. The conversation could have continued a few more days, could have at least gotten into the next weekend's news shows, and made it very, very awkward for the Democrats on those news shows, or why don't you want to seal the border to these gangs? But the president tweeted about uh, attack somebody, and the media could then have an excuse to ignore all of this other stuff. I, I think sometimes he hurts himself. Sometimes it's really good. And there are sometimes I occasionally text friends in the White House and say, Please get him to tweet on this particular issue. <laughs> Off, rarely does that ever happen. But I would really, I mean, there are things where the president trained his fire. Like, for example, I think the president should annihilate the Des Moines Register for trying to destroy that kid for raising money for charity. He should be relentless and point out, this is what I mean when I say they're the enemy of the people. Uh, that would be useful. The media would hate it. They would scream. But every American would say, yeah, you know, you're right. They screwed up here. And that would also help the kid and the charity, but he's busy this week. There, there are some times I've seen him almost as a master of deflection when there's a, you know, a media point that the left-leaning right. media is throwing at him, mm -hmm. and he can throw a, a, a tweet out there with some humor right. or some you know, bravado or whatever's right. necessary, and that becomes the story, and he literally leaves them standing. Yes, more of that, uh, less of the other. It, it, it's, it's having a superpower and figuring out how to use it. So what do you think about his domestic policy? We've talked about tariffs a little bit, but the Democrats' inability to counter anything that he's doing uh, leading up to the 2020 election. Well, you know, this is very interesting because uh, the Democrats' strategy here is very much what their strategy was in 2005 uh, against George W. Bush, which is just we're going to campaign on no, right. and everything's going to be no. And, and they think that works for them, a strategy based on no. They have no need to offer a competing agenda, just say, orange man, bad, no, uh, and find as many people as they can to vote for that. The problem is that the Democrats who are speaking up are giving us an agenda that's downright horrific. Uh, let's take your guns, let's take your straws, let's take your cows. Uh, and, you know, what's very funny is, is there's this real coordinated strategy. The media have said, oh, no serious Democrat really thinks about that. You got the guy you were in love with running against Ted Cruz now running for president <laughs> saying this. Yeah. You've got Kamala Harris, a senator, saying, "Let's take your straws and ban your beef." You got Andrew Yang, who you put on TV all the time, saying, "We should tax cows out of existence." Um, you know, this this isn't fringe people. This is the if the if it's only fringe people saying this, then the Democratic Party is fringe. Foreign policy. Now, this was the president who was going to put us into nuclear war. Uh, we were going to shred every relationship we had across the globe. Where, where do you think he stands? I mean, we all glow in the dark now, don't we? <laughs> uh, listen, I, I like the foreign policy. Uh, I think the foreign policy is good. I, I, I think he's being played by the North Koreans. I'm cautious there. Um, but by and large, we don't need to be in all these multinational treaties. The Paris Accord was a meaningless feel-good gesture that would have given the president broad powers to do things that he didn't need to do. He pulled us out of that. And what's happening? We're actually outperforming all the countries in the Paris Accord with our um, e emission standards. I think it's good that we have a real foreign policy again. Barack Obama felt the need to go around the world and apologize for the country. Donald Trump's going around the world apologizing for not putting the country first. Right, right. NATO is particularly interesting because he's been after all the NATO leaders about funding. Uh, they're not funding their proportional share. Um, and then he actually had the gall to question, why do we even have NATO? Because the Russians were the threat and they're no longer the threat, the Soviet Union. What's your take on the NATO situation? I, I think that uh, it, there's a naivety on his part on NATO uh, to not appreciate why we have this um, organization. We don't have NATO because of Russia. We have NATO because the European powers had a history of going into global war with everyone if the United States could not sit on top of them and try to help them direct policy and keep them from rearming. 
Um, and NATO actually, the only time they've ever used their power to help any country is after we were attacked on 9-11. Right. Um, I, I don't know why the president hates NATO as much. I, I understand that he looks at them as freeloaders. I do too. Uh, I think the United Nations is much more of a freeloader. And I think if the president wanted to go after an organization, he should go after the United Nations. And then there would be this great real estate deal for him in New York. <laughs> on the river. Um, I would much rather see the United Nations on than see NATO gone. Is Greenland still listed? I don't even Listen, know. I, 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 I would, I mean, my 10-year-old and I, we were ready to go enlist if we could invade Greenland. <laughs> well, you know, on the um, Second Amendment, um, there's, there's two uh, trail, uh, parallel proposals of thought there. There's one that they're going to try, the Democrats are going to try to make it some sort of, you know, change the Constitution, some amendment, or attack it, or restrict it, or so. And then the other one is, and I think they're, we're starting to see this, is they're just going to sue the gun companies in this submission. I mean, what do you see on that? Uh, well, you know, there's a law that you can't sue gun manufacturers for, for I injury caused by use of a gun any more than you can sue GM for a car wreck. Uh, but you've seen now in Connecticut uh, activist courts trying to find ways around that federal law. Uh, the Democrats are going to do everything they can to bankrupt the gun industry, and I think that the president is and understands he needs to stick up for it. You know, there's an interesting juxtaposition here in that uh, after Harvey Weinstein was accused of sexual harassment, he said he was going to go fight, donate his time and money to fight the NRA. Uh, Justin Trudeau is caught in blackface and suddenly let's go take away assault rifles, whatever an assault <laughs> rifle is. Uh, and so a lot of people are saying, oh, maybe the president will now go out and say, let's take people's guns and, and yeah. let's do gun control to try to build some stuff on the left. I think this president intuitively understands they wouldn't pee on him if he was on fire, so why give them anything? Right, and he loves to play the yo-yo issue thing where he'll throw it out there, yeah. and, and then, then everybody gets the gun, and then he pulls it right back, and he right. did that with the Second Amendment issue. You know, so I really do think part of his issue here is he's trying to focus group his own base. And the best way to focus group his own base is to let someone from the White House float an idea, not him. Notice they talk about it as the White House plan. In fact, when the, the plan came out the other day, I was very clear on radio to say, this is the White House plan, not the President's plan. And so they focus group it by saying it's the White House plan. People lost their business over it. And then the president comes out and says, nah, it's not my plan. Somebody from the White House came up with it. All right. uh, and I don't think we're going to go anywhere with it. it it's, it's for him who likes to be in touch with his base. It's a smart strategy for and, him. And, and the plays, problem is it confuses everybody. But it seems to play well for him. It doesn't stick with right. him. It, like, no, it, it, it doesn't stick. I mean, the Democrats get really, really jealous of the things that don't stick to this president. Right. Well, let, let's go to the state level real quick. David Ralston, Speaker mm -hmm. of the House, you've been one of his biggest opponents yep. and, and vocal opponents. Um, most of the people know that story where mm -hmm. you know he was representing and he was taking the time away right. and stalling cases, some extreme cases. Yes. Um, do you think that the legislature has the will to remove him? I think if Singleton beats Sackerson in the uh, House District 71, it becomes a wake-up call, given that the investment poured in to try to help her from the Speaker, and it's become an issue there. I think it's a wake-up call. The fact that Democrats said they wouldn't turn the Speaker issue into an issue, and they're now targeting uh, Deborah Silcox, uh, Chuck Martin, and a number of Republicans mm -hmm. on this issue, it's going to be a huge issue. Uh, the fact that you have AJC writers saying, oh, the Democrats assure us this isn't going to be an issue, that's a pretty big red flag it's going to be an issue. <laughs> that usually means yes. yeah, it's right on the doorstep. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Now, gambling, legalized gambling and legalized marijuana, where do you think we're looking at? Because I hear a lot more talk right. that something's coming through the legislature. Um, I, there are some who would like to legalize recreational marijuana, but there aren't the votes there. This hemp legislation, they essentially, you know, it's kind of funny, all these people saying, oh, you pass fetal heartbeat, you're going to have a prosecutor who's going to round up women who had miscarriages and prosecute them. Actually, no, but we did legalize hemp, and suddenly you got a bunch of prosecutors saying, hey, go smoke your weed, we're okay with it. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm concerned about the gambling one. I'm, I'm not opposed to putting a sports betting facility at, at the stadiums. Uh, most states do that now. My problem is, and I actually think the only smart thing Kasim Reed has ever said, is that there's never been a state to turn to gambling until it's given up. Right. Um, you build a casino in Atlanta. Uh, he's also said there's a reason that Las Vegas is in a desert. That's true, too. I mean, <laughs> Donald Trump could not sustain Atlantic City. Right. Um, Vegas is in a desert for a reason. Uh, you look at the states, and I'm from Louisiana, where we had a, a state Supreme Court that said our Constitution prohibits gambling. So the governor of the state had them all impeached to put new people on it. They said, oh, we're going to do gaming, not gambling. 
um, and, and let it go through. That's how Louisiana got casinos. Um, the money never works out. You're betting against the house, even as the state. You build a casino in Atlanta. You know, the people don't understand that the actual casino legislation in Atlanta required entertainment venue, and a port, uh, like 50% of the money had to come from entertainment, not from gambling. Well, that takes out the Fox. Mm -hmm. That takes out the Tabernacle. That takes out uh, Phillips Arena for concerts. That takes out uh, Chastain Park. Uh, and suddenly everybody's got to go to the casino. That hurts tons of local businesses. The number one business to be affected by a casino are local restaurants. They go out of business quick. Um, so it's a bad economic policy. The rates of drugs, prostitution, bankruptcy, alcoholism all go up. The rates of family violence go up. Uh, the, I mean, all sorts of things happen when you put a casino in an area. Uh, that The legislature, and by the way, those are the, the academic studies. Obviously, the ones paid for by the casino say it's never a problem. Um, if you want to put in a sports betting facility at, at, at Turner Field, at um, SunTrust Park, oh, God, I said it. Um, Brave Stadium, I'm sorry. I refuse, <laughs> refuse when they go to that truest, truest name. I'm never calling it that. Um, when you go to, to the garbage name stadium or go to Mercedes Benz, I don't have a problem. If there's a room people want to go in and, and they want to place a bet on, on a game, go for it. They're doing it on their phones right now. At least give us a share of the revenue. But to bring in a new gambling outfit, I, I've got a real problem with it if it's a casino, knowing what it'll do to local communities. Sure. Uh, the hot district, the 6th Congressional District up in North Metro, right. Lucy McBath mm -hmm. is in that spot. She was a gun act, uh, anti-gun right. activist, uh, and she's got the Trump factor against her. Where do you think that race is going? You know, it, one of the underappreciated stories from 2018 is that the National Republican Party told the Kemp campaign, focus outside of Atlanta and we'll do the door-to-door -door operations in Atlanta, and they never showed up. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know this from the vendor who had the contract to do the door-to-door -door operations for the, for the National Party. They never got paid, so they never went in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Handel campaign was told, and the Rob Woodall campaign was told, don't worry about your ground game, we've got you covered. Well, those people never showed up. McBath won. That district is still a Republican district. When you look at 2018, Democrats showed up like it was a presidential election. Republicans showed up like it was a midterm election. Well, 2020, the Republicans will show up like it's a presidential election. That tends to give them about 125,000 person cushion in the number. Uh, even with a Stacey Abrams-led registration act or effort, that still gives them about 100,000 person cushion. Um, you know, a, a people really, really totally forget that Stacey Abrams was able to register a million people over a two-year period in Georgia, 49,000 of them showed up. Right. Um, I mean, I, I ran the numbers myself. I, I, I walked through it on radio. You had a 49,000 person increase from 2016 for Hillary Clinton to 2018 with Abrams. Normally it goes down, but Abrams was able to get everybody back like it was a presidential election. But of those million new registered voters, only 49,000 showed up. Speaking of Governor Abrams, um, yes. <laughs> all hail. <laughs> Are we supposed to do the, the, the A? Vice President Kenshin A? Vice President Kenshin? No, she's nope. not going to be a vice president. Uh, she played her hand terribly on this. One, I don't think she wants it. She really wants a rematch against the usurper Brian Kemp. Um, she really, really, really looks at herself in the mirror every day and, and calls herself governor. She does not want to be vice president. She says she'll do it if offered, but I think she burned her bridge so bad with Joe Biden, the rest wouldn't want her. And it looks like Elizabeth Warren will probably be the nominee now because of the, Biden was going to be the nominee until the Ukraine thing. Right. Um, Elizabeth Warren will probably be the nominee. She's not going to want Stacey Abrams. She's going to want a more moderate, uh, centrist Democrat, just like Clinton with Kane. If, if Warren goes too progressive, yeah. she's going to turn people off, so she won't go with Abrams. Ossoff and Abrams really brought it to my attention about the money coming out of mm -hmm. California. Right. They're billionaires funding our elections, and what do you see on the horizon? Is that going to continue? Is it going to grow? Oh, it will, but they have a new tactic. Uh, they bring Hollywood studios and employees here, and they just become residents and vote. Um, I mean, the whole Amazon thing, I'm glad we lost Amazon, because if you actually read the proposal, they weren't hiring Georgians. They were bringing people from Portland, Oregon, and Seattle right. to come to Georgia and suddenly become Georgians. Uh, and that would have shifted the demographic. I, I've never understood why Nathan Deal invested so much time, talent, and treasure to bring a bunch of liberals into the state as voters. Um, but that's exactly what they did. They, instead of trying to build up Georgia companies, they tried to find national companies and bring them to Georgia, uh, often from progressive areas that had high taxes, and they brought the progressives who voted for those high taxes to Georgia to change our state. 
Um, I, I got to give credit where it's due to the Kim administration that's been very focused on finding small and mid-sized Georgia companies that exist now to help them become Fortune 500 companies. And on Brian and Kim, one of the most unusual gubernatorial campaigns I've ever seen, the shotgun with the, the, the yeah. daughter's boyfriend, Jay. Right. I always felt bad for poor Jay. I don't know what happened to poor Jay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but what, you know, explode, pickup trucks exploding right. on, what, what do you think about that? Was it, was it, Listen, was it a Trump momentum, a Trump tidal wave that he was riding? Um, so I, I have a little bit of inside knowledge here and don't hate me for saying this, but one of the best Books. I, I did campaign management and campaign strategy for a number of years, and one of the best books ever written on the subject was by James Carville and Paul Bayala, uh, Clinton strategists. And one of the things I remember most about that book, they had an entire chapter on this, never run a campaign to win the primary that costs you the general election. Your goal is to win the general election. Winning the primary is just part of that. Uh, and there were a lot of people who would argue that Brian Kemp came very close to winning the primary and losing the general because of some of his ads. He didn't. Um, but I can tell you, despite what all the critics say, and there are a lot of them in the Republican Party who now think they're his best friend and always have been, uh, Brian Kemp was ahead of Casey Cagle in early voting uh, leading into that runoff before the president endorsed him. And if he was ahead by as much as he was in early voting, he probably would have won same-day voting. He didn't need the president's endorsement. The president's endorsement, however, completely sealed the deal. Mm -hmm. um, and the president locked it in for him. Uh, and I think the Kemp campaign understands that enough, and the data bears it out in, in the <clears throat> after polling, that he was going to win with or without the president's support. It certainly tied him to the president in a way that the Abrams campaign tried to exploit, but it wasn't enough. And the Cagle campaign just disintegrated right there. Yeah, the well, and it didn't help that there was that recording that right. came out, too. Right. Um, yes. And again, we go back to politicians who would say things in public to rally the crowd and privately didn't really mean it. I mean, that fed into that cynicism. I want to take a few questions from the audience, so be thinking of some questions, and, and I'll, I'll finish on some of these. Um, Senator McConnell, uh, Mitch McConnell, is, is he a shrewd politician? Uh, he comes off sometimes, you know, the turtle right. yeah. rip. And, I look, and, I, and I have <laughs> never been a McConnell fan, but he has certainly gotten these judges through, and he deserves credit for that. He's a very self-interested politician. He will do what's in his interest. It is in his interest to get this stuff done, so he's doing it. Um, the moment he thinks the president is a hindrance to the Republicans keeping the Senate is the moment the president gets a call from McConnell saying, maybe you should be a Nixon-type elder statesman. Right. Kavanaugh obviously getting abused by right. the left. Why so much Kavanaugh and not, uh, not really Gorsuch? Why do, you, why do you think the difference is between Because them? Gorsuch was a replacement for Scalia, and Kavanaugh was a replacement for Kennedy, and Kennedy was a swing voter, and I, I think that explains to some degree the Robert shift to try to think if he becomes wobbly, Democrats may say, okay, okay, we can, we can deal with this. Um, it's not really working for him. Um, but also, you know, they, the Democrats are sending a message that they're going to make these really, really brutal battles from here on out. This also happened before the midterm election, and they thought right. this could help us get women voters. I don't actually think the data is there to show it. They have some polling that suggested I, I don't think it's real. Um, but, you know, they're, they want to define this as illegitimate. They essentially want to define every aspect of this president's administration is illegitimate. You know, Kavanaugh, do you think they're going to break his will and start to get him fading, or are they going to build his resolve? I think they build his resolve. Um, you know, he's very much in a bubble now where he wasn't before. And in that bubble, he's got a support group uh, within the Federalist Society and others who can buck him up and give him resolve. You know, he was never really anyone's first pick. And that's what I think the media really misses here. There were People wanted the president to go big or go home, and he didn't quite do it. Uh, but he's also the pick that sealed the president for a lot of people who didn't like him in 2016, myself included. I mean, which other president would have gone to bat for a guy like that, given what they were facing? Most of them would have folded. The president stood up for him and fought for him. Uh, ironically, President George W. Bush did as well, behind the scenes. Um, but showing just how nasty the Democrats were going to go to destroy a good man right. who spent his Tuesdays at a homeless shelter feeding the poor people, uh, and that wasn't for show, that's what he's done for years, I think it really made a difference for a lot of people. That, you know, the president really is willing to stand up for these guys. Let's jump across the Atlantic real quick. Last mm -hmm. two questions from the stage. Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. is she leading the destruction of Europe as we oh, know? Oh, yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. And she's got her reasons for doing it. I think she's well-intentioned. 
but she's also very foolish. It's probably time for her to go. She's led a, a very strong federal vision in Germany, embracing the idea that you need a strong united Europe for peace, um, that any one country getting too strong would be bad. That's why she really doesn't want uh, Britain to break away with Brexit. But I think the public in Germany has probably gotten tired of her. Well, we obviously know how Trump and the Ukrainian president feel yes. about her because that came out in the, yeah. in the, in the transcript. Um, going over to Brexit, do you think it's finally going to happen, regardless of whether they make a deal with the EU or not? And what do you think of Boris Johnson? Is he the right guy at the right time? Yeah, you know, I, I actually kind of <clears> like <throat> Boris Johnson. And it's very interesting. You definitely do get a sense that there is an elite and they're doing everything possible to save the people from themselves in their minds. Uh, but I think this goes forward. I, I think, I mean, they voted. Uh, they voted to leave. you got to leave. Now the question is, to what extent do you leave? And I, I think it's going to happen. They certainly did put the Queen in an awkward position to prorogue Parliament and then say it was an unconstitutional act when they don't have a constitution, they have a Queen. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they, they, they put her against herself. Uh, I, I, I mean, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm a monarchist. I would love for her to stay, say, you know, I, I guess i got to dissolve Parliament and have an election, even though no one asked her to, but th there's no way she would ever do that. Um, but I, I do think Boris is a very interesting person. He's People compare him to Donald Trump. He's not. Um, he is every bit the intellect that Donald Trump really isn't and never has cared to be, uh, but he works very hard to not come off that way. Right. Um, that Brexit party was probably one of the greatest political experiments. Right. Or, or I mean, the fact that, what, what did they, what, they yeah, put I mean, that together was, four months it, before four months, the election? Yeah. Uh, Twelve weeks before the election. And they, and they won. Died. Yeah. I mean, it was just uh, incredible. It, it, should, it, it tells the British that there is still very much a movement afoot for exiting the EU, and if the Conservative Party doesn't, uh, there's a party to stand up, and that's the only thing they agree on, but they'll do it. More of the countries in Europe are leaning, bringing in some leaders to the right. Is it too little too late for them? It, no, I don't think so. It, it depends on their government will to do it, and that's one reason I think the Europeans want to make it as painful for Britain as possible to leave, is they want to dissuade the next country that wants to leave. Right, right. Um, if you're not on his Facebook page or his Twitter page, you need to get on there, friend him. Instagram's uh, the best because I don't do politics there. But, but no, but you get some incredible insights and you get it in real time. I love looking at your Facebook page and, and your, all your other accounts. And sometimes you just give me some really good laughs. So you've got a great <laughs> sense of humor and you put some zingers in there every now and then too. And on behalf of the Fayette County Republican Party, thank you so much for all your generous time that you've lent sure. to us. And um, if you want to see this again or tell your friends, um, go, tell them to go to myfayettegop.org, myfayettegop.org, and uh, they can see the rebroadcast. So thank you very much. Let's give Eric thank a big hand. Thank you.